Uh, today we'll talk about how we can uh, learn better word representations um, by using knowledge that goes beyond the distributional hypothesis. <clears throat> so let's start with words. Uh, when you look at a word like play, uh, to, a, to a human mind, the first thing that would come is, uh, what are the two meanings of this word, or what are the n meanings of this word? Um, and that is probably some of the, one of the most important things. But uh, that's not just it. Uh, a word has a lot of other properties, like you know, it has a spelling, it has a pronunciation, uh, it has a syntactic part of speech, and it is related to other words uh, in different ways. So there are a lot of uh, properties about words that we want to know uh, in order to process it well, or the computer needs to know what are the different things that it should know about these words <coughs> in order to process it intelligently. Um, and uh, uh, to get something, that a computer can process, people have discovered uh, something called word representations where you basically take a word and you represent it in terms of numbers or uh, some objects or something like that. And these are some of the easiest, uh, this is the easiest way of having a word representation. For example, suppose that you have 100,000 words in your vocabulary, uh, then uh, you can represent a word by just one index in that vocabulary. And the rest of the elements are zero, so uh, the word play, takes the dimension number one, the word run takes dimension number two, and then the word plays and runs take dimension number three and four. So although this is fine and easy, the, the problem is that there is absolutely no correlation between the meanings of these words, and it's also intractable because it's really high dimensional, and we don't want to be dealing with such a high dimensional uh, object when we are using this uh, in applications. <clears throat> so the word play and run are as similar as the word play and plays. There's absolutely no correlation between uh, how these words are uh, similar to each other. Um, uh, then there was another, uh, another way in which you can represent word is word clusters, where you take a large unsupervised corpus and run some word clustering algorithm, and at the end of the day, you come up with these word clusters where a bunch of words are grouped into one single cluster. And these clusters are supposed to capture some sort of meaning about the words. And these clusters also we can represent in terms of a vector, where suppose the total number of clusters was 100, then whatever the words are in, whichever words are in one cluster, uh, you give them one to that particular dimension. So let's assume that play and run got grouped into uh, cluster number one, and the word plays and runs grouped, uh, got grouped into cluster number three. <clears throat> Another way in which you can have uh, word representations is word lexicons. Um, these are any, uh, any lexicon uh, tagged by humans uh, where you give a word to a human and it tells you what are the different properties that this word pro uh, possesses. So all the properties are going to be the dimensions and if a word uh, has this property then you give it a one for that particular dimension, else you give it a zero. Um, and these lexicons are really tough to obtain because um, all this linguistic information is supposed to come from a human and we have to pay humans whenever we ask them to work. So these are some of the kinds of word representations in which you can represent a word meaning and give it to a computer. Uh, and like the most important one, or not the most important one, the most famous one these days are word vectors, um, where an, a word is basically represented in terms of real numbers. Um, say you want to uh, represent the meaning in 100 dimensions, then you, then you can use a bunch of different algorithms to come up with these sort of representations. <coughs> and, uh, words which have similar meaning should have similar values for a given dimension and so on. Um, so I think everybody in this no room would already know what word vectors are and how they are used. Um, and these word representations are really, really useful because they are really good to use as features in different NLP tasks like NER, dependency parsing, POS tagging, um, sentiment analysis, etc., etc. So there have been a lot of papers and there have been some survey papers which uh, sort of show how these representations can be used in different tasks. <coughs> so the question now is, uh, these representations are nice and good and they are useful, but how do we obtain them? Um, and the easiest way to obtain them is using the distributional hypothesis, which is, kind, which is a very nice and simple hypothesis, which gives you a lot without doing a lot. So this hypothesis says that you shall know a word by the company it keeps. What it means is when you look at words uh, in a given corpus and look at uh, what are the other words that appear in this given word's context, if the context is similar, the word meaning should be similar. So for example, uh, the word playing uh, and running in this paragraph you can see occurs in context of boy, the, is, in the, and the words field and playground also occur in similar context. 
So, uh, when you extract these counts over the whole corpus, you sort of get an idea of which word should have similar meaning depending on what context it was occurring in. Um, and a simple way to uh, extract this information is by a word, word co-occurrence matrix, um, where the row of the matrix are the words that you want to obtain representations for. And the columns of the matrix can be any features. So for example, in this, in this, uh, in this figure, these are again just words. So this is a huge matrix, which is a word-to-word -word co occurrence matrix, and it's, it's of the size of the vocabulary times vocabulary. Um, and this is a very large matrix. Uh, and although it has useful information, uh, we don't want to use it in this given form. So you can do something like latent, latent semantic analysis, where you take this large word co occurrence matrix and decompose it into uh, uh, smaller matrices of lower dimension. Uh, so for example, by using SVD, or singular value decomposition, you can obtain uh, the, late, uh, the lower dimensional form of this matrix U by factorizing the big matrix M. Or you can also um, do some neural language modeling, which was proposed by Benzio in 2003, where every word is represented by a vector. And these, the, the vectors of the previous words are used to predict what is going to be the next word in the sequence. So by doing language modeling, they actually obtained these word embeddings, uh, which they found, uh, uh, which they found that the the embeddings really corresponded well to what the meaning of the word was. So that was a byproduct. Um, uh, but in earlier times, people just used to do latent semantic analysis, where uh, they can decompose this whole huge word coherence matrix to get uh, word representations. <coughs> So in this way, uh, you can go from the hypothesis to word representations. You can extract information from corpus and go to good word representations. But what we are going to ask in this talk is, is distributional information all that we need? Uh, are there really some other important sources of information that we can use uh, to improve these vector representations? So in my work, I have, ex uh, I have explored different sources of these informations, which can be used uh, to improve these word vector representations. Um, for example, uh, if you have a semantic lexicon, a lexicon that was constructed by humans, uh, and it tells you how two words are related to each other, can you use that information to uh, get vector representations? Um, or, for ex uh, or if, you, if you know what the morphology of the word is, how the word was composed, can you use those components of the word to uh, get better representations? And another third, uh, another third dimension that I explored was uh, we, we do not want to just look in the context of the given language of a word. Why don't we look at how the word translates across languages and whether it is useful or not? For example, uh, the sentence here, the boys are playing, uh, is translated to two Arabic sentences. And if you look at these sentences, the word playing is aligned to two given Arabic words. So by this, uh, by this information kind of tells us that probably the meaning of these two uh, Arabic words, yelab and yelaboon, should be similar because they have the same translation in English. So there are all these bunch of different information that we can use to improve word representations. And again, as I showed, there are many different word representations that we can again enrich. Uh, so we can enrich vectors, we can enrich clusters, we can enrich lexicons. Um, so if you take the cross product of how the words can be represented and how can they can be improved, it would be a big uh, uh, it would be a big list. But we'll talk about two particular instances uh, in this given talk. In the first talk, I'll show how you can use word vectors, uh, how you can use semantic lexicons to improve word vectors. And in the second part, I'll, uh, I'll show how uh, using morphological knowledge, uh, you can expand human annotated lexicons. Um, and we'll be using morphosyntactic lexicons here. <coughs> uh, if anybody has any questions, just like you can, you can ask me during the talk. Uh, all right, so let's get started with the first part. This, word, uh, this work was accepted at NACL last year. Uh, and this was my work at CMU. So uh, in this figure, uh, you see uh, a very, very simplified form of WordNet, where from WordNet, you have extracted information of which words are connected by the synonymy relation. So in this figure, 
uh, words like wrong, false, flawed, incorrect, untrue, etc., are all connected to each other. And whenever uh, we are going to assume that whenever two words have an edge between them, they are similar in meaning or they are connected by a semantic relation. And in this case, it's the synonymy relation. So this kind of information can be used to improve vector representation of words which were kind of infrequent or which were not, uh, which were not seen already during training. Uh, and this information is absolutely correct information because it comes from, uh, from humans, like it's annotated by humans and uh, it has taken years to uh, construct these lexicons. So this is really important information that we want to uh, use. <clears throat> so let's just write, write in, dive into the method. Uh, and the method is called retrofitting because uh, we take a bunch of word vectors and we then on top of that we apply knowledge coming from the semantic lexicons. So you are taking something which already exists and you are modifying it. <coughs> And now the, I saw the, a paper came up in uh, NACL which was named counterfeiting. So we have uh, kind of you know, like made this line where people are writing papers <laughs> related to this term. <clears throat> uh, when, when this uh, term was first coined by NOAA, I didn't even know what retrofitting meant because I'm not a native speaker of English. <laughs> um, so in this figure, you see uh, red nodes and white nodes. In red nodes, we are representing uh, word vectors learned according to distributional information. And in white nodes, we want to obtain words which would uh, have information coming from both the distributional information and the information coming from the semantic lexicon. <clears throat> and thus, the white nodes uh, are connected to other white nodes uh, whenever they have uh, similar, uh, whenever they share a semantic relation in the lexicon. And the parameters, uh, the vectors in the white node are, are parameters, and these are the parameters that we want to learn. These will be the retrofitted vectors. So if you see, there are uh, words in red and white which are common, uh, and thus we connect them uh, by edges. Again, because we want these two kinds of vectors to have similar representations. We want these words to have similar representation. But this graph looks like a very, very noisy graph because you know all the words <coughs> which are supposed to be close together, which are supposed to be closer in meaning, are spread apart. And this anyway doesn't look like a pleasant graph to look at. And so this is, uh, let's call this a sad graph. Um, uh, what we want to do is go from a graph like this to a happier graph where words which have similar meaning are close together uh, and, they <coughs> and, they, uh, and they want to ob uh, obey information coming from both the kinds of nodes. And so <coughs> how, how can we uh, go from a sad graph to a happy graph? Uh, we can do this by simply forcing uh, vectors in these nodes which are connected together to have similar representations. So we have edge potentials. A potential is just, just some form of distance between how different these vectors are. And we want to minimize these edge potentials over the whole graph. <clears throat> and there are two kinds of potentials. The first potential is between a white node and a red node. And a second potential is between two white nodes. And they can be weighed differently. So what's the easiest way in which we can uh, compute how two vectors are different, it's, it's Euclidean distance. Um, so we use Euclidean distance to measure how different two vectors are. And uh, uh, we weigh them by different factors, alpha and beta. And when we sum this, uh, these factors over the whole graph, we get an equation like this, um, where the first term in this equation is basically uh, measuring how different a retrofitted node is to its original distributional estimate, the red node. And the second term is how different a uh, retrofitted vector is to other retrofitted vectors, uh, which is the information coming from the lexicon. <clears throat> so this term is combining information coming from the distributional space and information coming from the lexicon, and we want to minimize this. So this, this is a very easy uh, objective function to minimize because it's just Euclidean distances, it's convex in nature. So you just take a uh, derivative of this equation with respect to your parameter which is qi, and you equate it to zero. Uh, and when you do that, you get an iterative update uh, like this, uh, where at every given instance, at every given time step, <coughs> retrofitting is telling a vector qi to become closer to its neighbors in the graph. So it's, if you look at this equation closely, it's nothing but just the weighted sum uh, of the neighbors of the vectors. So that's, uh, that's basically it. At every time step, you tell you yourself to become similar to your neighbors. 
and you keep doing that again and again till you obtain convergence, till no longer you see that you are changing. <coughs> Um, so that's all. That's uh, that's all what retrofitting is. It's a very simple method that can be used to uh, uh, improve. I mean, hypo uh, we are hypothesizing that we will improve, but we, the results will show whether we improve the vectors or not. <coughs> so this kind of work was. Oh, sorry. Oh, on your previous slide, uh, the epi, theta, ideas, these are hyperparameters. These are hyperparameters, um, and we just fix them, but you can tune them to get even better performance. Uh, yeah. um, I had a question about the detail and a broader question. So the question about the detail in your previous slide, the all the edges between red nodes and white nodes were between identical words. Is that an artifact of the example or is that always the case? It's always the case. So um, I'm confused why one wouldn't effectively say these are the same. It's the same word, mm -hmm. different representations of the same word. Um, exactly, yeah. Um, so why are you kind of tuning a distance between those instead of using some kind of identity function? Right, because you don't know what the white nodes are. You never knew you what the night nodes the are. You told me. They're the same mm -hmm. as, the, as the red nodes. They're the same as the red nodes in the beginning. So all the white nodes are initialized to the values of the vectors in the red nodes. But then at every iteration, you want a given white node to also become similar to different white nodes. <coughs> that is the information that is coming from the lexicon. So you know that the white, the white flawed should be similar to the red flawed, of course. But if you just stop there, you have basically copied the distributional information. Uh, but in this framework, you also want to say that the white flawed should also be similar to the white wrong and the white false and some other synonyms of the word, right? Right, so I guess my confusion shows my broader question, which I don't understand what more specifically you're trying to achieve. So how do we know when this converges to a good state? What, what's the goal of this process? The goal of this process is to obtain vectors that uh, contain information both from distributional context and also from the semantic lexicon. So the information coming from the lexicon is just telling you whether or not the representations of two different words should be similar. But the information coming from the distributional information is just what is the vector of this word. So, so if I want to contain information from both sources of information, mm -hmm. isn't there an infinite uh, set of ways to do that? So what's What's the right way? Or what's there the are, there way? are, yeah, there are infinite ways of doing this. And we, and basically I, I went for this way because I always tend to do the easiest thing first. And, uh, and if it works, I just stop there and I ask myself, do we really need to do something else or not? Um, so this is easy because it doesn't care about how you learned the word vectors. You can learn them using SVD, using CCA, you can, mm -hmm. using neural networks, etc. There are different models. And so that was actually the next slide, which is uh, saying that a lot of people have tried to incorporate information from lexicons into word vectors. And they have also tried, they have tried to do that while training the vectors themselves, right? <clears throat> As you said, there are a million ways. And so there are like five or six papers, not million papers, but like these six papers have done this. And the uh, way our work differs is, um, that most of their work was actually also focused on just doing it for skip gram vectors because they were the most famous at that given time. And uh, they were trying to get information from the lexicon while, uh, while training the objective function for a given vector representation itself. And so for every, whenever you, whenever you want to do that, you will have to change the objective function of your original vector learning method because it co it's going to be different for different methods of learning vectors, and you need to retrain <coughs> the vectors on the corpus again and again. But our method is kind of agnostic to that fact. It just says, given a set of word vectors, can we improve this now using information or not from the lexicons? And our information uh, and our method is independent of the kind of vector learning model and also to the lexicons. Yes. Can you back this up for a slide? One more. So here, you said you did the simplest thing. Wouldn't it have been simpler to just make all of the white nodes red, get rid of the red nodes, mm -hmm. and define a, I wonder if you could define a, an essentially equivalent function just with one parameter instead of two. Does, does this question make sense? Um, so the two parameters are what? So you have, you have a hyperparameter on your black factor and a hyperparameter on your white factor. 
right? right? Mm -hmm. Thus, because you're representing it from there. Right. But, so, but if instead you just made that red node the white node, you made those the same node, and then have a single factor with a single. Right. Factor. So the so uh, these I did try that. So I had different <coughs> uh, sets of alphas and betas. And we kept alpha to be 1 and kept beta to just uh, be 1 divided by the degree of the node. And the intuition behind that is, to, is that we want the retrofitted node to be very close to its distributional estimate, but also respect the information coming from other sources. Uh, <clears throat> and that's why these are essentially different uh, weighting schemes. But you can try a bunch of different weighting schemes where you, know, you have different weights and you can tune those hyperparameters on a given evaluation task and then just tune it all again. But our intuition was that we don't really want to go very far apart from what the original estimate was because these are really uh, sophisticated models which are doing these things and this is good information. <coughs> Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, and this because the values in the red nodes are fixed, you are supposed to, you are going to converge at some point. Right. You can't keep uh, optimizing. <coughs> All right. So that's how we differ. Yeah. Um, maybe you mentioned this, but I missed it. Um, so the lexicon is based on words and whereas with vectors, presumably, uh, don't disintegrate in sentences. So how do you? Uh... Right. So I'm not. So I'm using the most simplified uh, sense of WordNet where I'm not using any census information at the moment. So I'm doing it totally sense agnostic. I take sense agnostic word vectors and I use information from the lexicon in a sense agnostic way. <coughs> do you, if a word has multiple senses, do you just merge? I just merge them for the time being. But you can choose to not merge them. <coughs> or identify which sense you want to use the most and stuff like that. But for, for WordNet, we do not use any sense. Did you try other things like taking the dominant sense instead of um, Not really, uh, because our aim was not just using WordNet. We, WordNet was just one of the lexicons. We were also using Paraphrase Database, which is, like, which is actually a much better lexicon because it's very big and very nice uh, in that way. Uh, but there was an, there's another paper by one of my co-authors of this paper who has actually tried to split these things according to word senses. But that's not what we tried in this particular work. Yes? So I understand that it's easier to just let whatever proxy you take down and then just use two equivalent distance weights um, to them together. But intuitively, why would you, why would your method give better results as opposed to just deprocessing by training it? Because it seems to me that if you do the, if you do it all together, you should get a more precise model versus Right, that is true. I think if you have the perfect way of tuning uh, the information from the lexicon while training, you'll be able to do better. But the problem, and we did have some experiments and they are there in the paper and it's not in the slide, but that, that never really happens that well because there are a lot of hyperparameters again when you are tuning, training while, uh, when you are training the vectors themselves while using the information from the lexicon. And then again, you have to design that differently for every given model. So our aim was basically to come up with a method which doesn't care about the model. And so that's why we do this in a post-processing way. But if you have the best way, if you know what is the best way of incorporating that information while training, you might even get better results. So what how about just adding maybe uh, loss terms to the loss function of the actual training? Yeah. So that's one of the ways, and we did explore it. But then you have to weight it by something because you don't know how important that is. So that's where all these Bayesian models for training hyperparameters. Exactly, come in. exactly. Uh, but that's that's again gets everything very slow. Like you, I don't want to do Bayesian optimization in training word vectors. Nobody's going to use it. <coughs> but as a research problem, I would do that. But our aim is basically to have a single method that can improve any kind of word vector as fast as possible. That's why we are doing it in this way. Exactly. So a word vector doesn't have mm -hmm. quality. Um, so depending on whether you're doing application A, B, C, or D, mm -hmm. quality is, is going to be different. And right. So what this essentially is offering, as I understand, is a way of saying, okay, I have two different sources of information. I want to set the correct parameters to trade them off against each other and mm -hmm. say, okay, I prefer this one this much more than X. And then you set that probably based on the end of the application. Right. Because so. It's hard Quality 
Right. So that's why I, I said that you can tune the values of, if, if you have one particular task in mind, you can tune the values of alpha and beta for that particular task. But we did not have one task in mind, so we like evaluated on five or six different tasks, and we did not tune those parameters for those things. We fixed them by our intuition, and just tried a couple of different values, but not task-specific. But this can be done totally task-specific. If you want to optimize, then it, it would perform better, of course, for that given task, if you do it in a task-specific fashion. So is it fair to summarize what you're saying is this is a lot more convenient, tractable kind of uh, right. uh, process, but other methods would actually perform better or likely perform better for an individual. Right. Definitely. Uh, that's true. <coughs> I'm still stuck on this ambiguity in red. that after you train it, red is going to mean 50% of the time color and 50% of the time common, which may not be what you want. That, that is true. And uh, that is totally true. And that is uh, not a drawback, but something that we just didn't do in this particular model. Uh, and uh, it depends on the task that you want to solve. I guess like I was probably not looking at tasks where the senses of information is so important. And that's why I didn't care about that particular thing. Uh, but uh, it's true that it's it's giving you a sense of an average meaning of the word, not sense-specific meaning. And that's a limitation, if you'd call it a limitation. <coughs> but works for me. Um, so, okay, uh, I think we should. Uh, so I'm just going to show a couple of experiments. We have a lot of experiments, but I'm just going to show a couple of experiments which kind of show that this thing works. So we are taking pre-trained glove word vectors and skip gram vectors, which have been trained on billions of words. So they have been trained on a lot of words so that you know uh, they, can prob they are probably capturing everything that they were supposed to capture. And, uh, uh, and we use information and we use paraphrase database uh, and WordNet as two sources of uh, lexicons for improving these word vectors. So in paraphrase database, you have, a, you have sets of phrases which have similar meaning, and you also just have sets of words which have similar meaning. So we are just using that lexical component where a pair of words are given. Uh, so we are just using synonymous words from the paraphrase database. And from WordNet, we are using information coming from synonyms, hy hypernames, and hyponyms. So in the first setting, we only use synonyms. And in the second setting, we use everything together. <coughs> All right, so uh, very quickly, word sim uh, for evaluation, one of the tasks is word similarity, where you are supposed to find out how well your word vectors correspond to similar the notion of similarity according to humans. So uh, there is a list of words, uh, the, the list of pairs of words given similarity according to humans, and uh, the same list of uh, pairs of words given similarity according to the vectors, and the similarity here is just the cosine distance, and we report the Spearman's correlation ratio. And there are a bunch of tasks, uh, but we just select a few uh, for showing the results. <coughs> So, uh, uh, okay, so on word similarity, when we take uh, skip gram vectors trained on billions of words and we retrofit it using paraphrase database, we, show, we see that on the MEN word similarity task, which has 3,000 pairs of words, our Spearman's correlation uh, ratio goes from 67.8 to 73.2, and this also remains consistent ac across two other tasks. <coughs> So in this way, we can show that for word similarity, word vectors are improving according to retrofitting. So right, you, it ha you have to check for every given task whether it is improving or not. It might be the case that for a sense-specific task, it might just not work. <coughs> uh, the second task is sentiment analysis, where given a, given a sentence, you have to basically just give it a positive or negative uh, rating, whether, whether the sentiment is positive or not. And we are using the Socher's uh, mover, uh, movie reviews data set. And since our aim was basically to capture the quality of word vector representations, we just took word vectors as features. So what we do is we take word vectors for all the words in a given sentence, we average it out, and we use it in a logistic regression classifier <coughs> to, uh, to predict the sentiment label. And again, in this case, I'm showing you glove word vectors, uh, but we have results for all of them. Uh, so in word, glove word vectors, when you enrich them again using paraphrase database, you see that the performance goes up by an absolute 2% improvement in accuracy. So this is uh, a very good accuracy, which comes at hardly any cost. 
and <clears throat> this thing uh, remains consistent, although not so much of improvement when you use the word net synonyms and when you use the word net synonyms, hypernames and hyponyms. So maybe because we are merging all the senses of different hypernames and hyponyms, the vectors are not improving that well and that's why the performance improvement is the lowest for the last case. <clears throat> okay, so quickly the last experiment in retrofitting was basically to check if you have enough number of dimensions to capture all the information coming from distributional hypothesis, can you still improve those vectors? So for verifying that, we trained word vectors from length 50 all the way up to 1200, and then we applied retrofitting on top of them uh, to see if we can still get improvements. <clears throat> and we see that we consistently get improvements all the way by using information coming from the lexicons. So th this is something which shows that the information present in lexicons is actually useful. And even if you train it on billions or trillions of words, there might be some little improvement that you can do by using retrofitting. <clears throat> Okay, so now that we know uh, lexicons can improve word vectors, we can say that you shall know a word by its neighbors in a semantic lexicon. Uh, and this was the first part of the talk. Uh, here we learned how we can use uh, information coming from semantic lexicons to improve word vectors. And now we will see how we can use morphological information coming from inside the word. So instead of looking at the context of word in a corpus, you want to look at inside the word and see if you can use that information to improve uh, uh, <clears throat> improve uh, 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 lexicons or expand lexicons. Uh, this work was done uh, with uh, Ryan McDonald and Radu Sorikat at my last internship at Google London. <clears throat> um, so what are morphosyntactic lexicons? Morphosyntactic lexicons are lexicons which basically capture what are the morphological and syntactic roles of words in a language. Uh, so it's basically something like this table where you have a given word and you just list what are the different properties it possesses. Uh, and this is uh, annotated by humans. <clears throat> and so this is very, very uh, rich linguistic information because for words like playing, it's, all, it's telling you that it can be a verb, it can also be a noun, it is in the present tense and it's in the gerund verb form. And there are like many, many more properties, but I'm just showing a bunch of uh, small properties. <clears throat> so these are morphosyntactic lexicons and they are really, really useful in a lot of tasks like machine translation, tagging, parsing, morphological tagging, etc. And just because they, this is such rich linguistic information that's present and it's very, very useful in all, these, all of these tasks. But the problem is that these lexicons are constructed manually and the, the fact that they are constructed manually means that you know, they are only available for a few languages for which you have annotator. And this, even, if we, even if these lexicons are present, the size of these lexicons is pretty small. So our aim in this work was basically to construct these lexicons for many, many languages in more or less uh, at an automatic fashion. So we want to construct these large lexicons for all the languages uh, that you can imagine and we want to do this automatically. <clears throat> so let, let's look at the lexicon entries for the words run and play. Uh, we can see that these entries are almost identical. They're actually totally identical and this we already know because we, from the distributional hypothesis, from the distributional information, we know that the words run and play have similar meaning. So if the words run and play have similar meaning, this figure probably shows that you know, the set of linguistics properties should also be the same. So distributional inf uh, hypothesis is again important, but if you look at another table <coughs> with words playing, running and played, you, you see that some of the features are shared across some words and some of the features are not shared across some words. So, for example, the words, uh, the words playing and running, both of which have ing, uh, are in the present tense and are in the gerund verb form. And the words play, playing and played, both of which have the lemma play, have the part of speech tag of verb. <clears throat> so, although distributional hypothesis in, is, info, uh, is useful, uh, we show that morphology is important as well. If you know about the morphology of a given word, you can again find out whether some of the linguistics properties are going to remain the same or not. <clears throat> and we want to exploit this information. So again, uh, uh, in, with, in this graph, we want to basically <clears throat> annotate, we want to take the words of a language and we want to, uh, and we construct edges between the words whenever they share some features uh, between those words. So for example, if, <clears throat> if the words jump and play occur in, a, occur in the same distributional cluster, we'll have an edge between them and we'll show that this is cluster number 50. Um, 
if the words jumping and playing have similar suffix, ing, we will have that as a feature. And the, the suffix features are very easy, suffix and prefix features, because we just look at string matching and see if they have similar features or not. And another uh, cute feature here is the morphological transformation feature, which we get from Radu Sorikat's morphological transformation tool, where uh, he trains this on a large corpus, and at the end of the day, he gets out, uh, gets these pairs of words and uh, the morphological transformations between them. So for example, uh, the uh, feature suffix epsilon ing means that you can go from the word play to the word playing if you add a suffix to it, uh, if you add suffix ing to it. And if you can go from word playing to play if you replace the suffix ing with epsilon. <coughs> It's statistical, so you can tell it uh, how many uh, how many characters at most you want in a char in, in the transformation, and it can. I think it's probably trained for like four at max, <clears throat> and it statistically first of all determines whether a given suffix should actually be a suffix or not, because you know you can't say that the word play has suffix ay, for example. So it finds out what are the probably the valid set of suffixes, and then it uh, calculates these transformations. But it, can do complex things. it can do complex things. Uh, what? It doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, so it doesn't generate morphology. It takes existing words and it finds out patterns between them. So it can go from run to running. Yes, by n i n g. If uh, if there in, there are enough number of those examples in the corpus. So it depends on the size of the corpus. <clears throat> and these transformations are actually trained on the Google's. I guess I don't know the billion word news corpus and also it's pretty. Uh, it has good coverage that way. Um, so we, we construct this graph uh, which tells us how, uh, in which ways two different words are related. And now we want to use these, this information between these two words to find out how their uh, linguistic attributes or their morphosyntactic attributes are related according to these figure, uh, features. For example, the word played here is in past tense. So its tense present is minus one. And the word playing is in uh, present tense. So its tense present is plus one. And we want to basically find out how we can <coughs> go from attribute this attribute to that attribute as a function of the features uh, that are shared between them. So we represent the features by a simple uh, binary vector. Uh, where we collect these features across the whole corpus. And for a given edge, you basically have a set of ones and zeros, uh, which tells you what features, are, uh, uh, what, what features are shared in between these two words. <coughs> and when I, uh, when I was devising this solution, uh, I just devised this solution myself uh, by just assuming that I again want my attribute to be uh, similar to my neighbor's attributes. But how similar that's going to be would depend on what features they are sharing and how important those features are. So phi wv here is the feature vector. And theta i is the weights learned for those feature vectors. <clears throat> so you basically, uh, phi dot theta is the strength of that particular edge. And you determine how much of that, how useful that is in predicting uh, uh, the given attribute ai for the word w, given the attributes v for the uh, given the attributes ai for the word v, and because we want these attributes to remain in the range of minus one to plus one, we just apply a nonlinearity of tan h uh, to get this. <coughs> and although this is how I designed the equation, uh, I later on later out I later on found out that this is an Ising model, and this is the naive mean field approximation of that Ising model. So Ising models are some physical physics uh, phys physics models where you have some ferromagnetic poles and whatnot, and in the stable state, uh, the, <coughs> uh, the spin of a given uh, atom is determined by the spin of its neighboring atoms in this way. So this was a, <laughs> this was a good find, because it kind of told us that you know, what we are doing makes sense. <coughs> so this is the equation according to, yes? Since you mentioned Ising model, so it's also known that mean field approximations are, are typically very poor approximations of that ferromagnetic vector. Right. Uh, what we we basically just want to get uh, the attribute values for a given node according to its neighbor. So even though it might be a poor approximation, if it's going to work for us in the uh, in the you know in in extrinsic uh, evaluations, we will use it. 
so this is definitely not the best way. Like you can never, uh, you know, estimate the best model for the icing models because it's going to have a very big complexity. Uh, but uh, this is a notion, this gives us a good average notion of what the value should be. And so we we don't care about what icing models are. We later out found out what icing models are, but this is what we want to do. <clears throat> so if you know the weights theta, you basically can uh, can compute what your attribute value should be given your neighboring attribute values. And so, uh, and okay, so this is basically the graph propagation model and how it's different from standard graph propagation models is basically we here are learning whether we selectively want to propagate a given attribute or invert its value. We do not just always propagate the value. So the, the tense present can also go to its negative form uh, from one node to another or it can just transform uh, accordingly uh, 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 <coughs> to another word given what features they share. And here the similarity is modeled in terms of what features, uh, similarity between two nodes is modeled in terms of what function, uh, what features they share. <clears throat> um, so this is the attribute estimation model. And since I stated like in the beginning of the talk, there's the, we have these lexicons which are annotated by humans. Uh, and these lexicons are very, very small. So we have like a thousand word lexicon, uh, which we call the label nodes here shown in gray. And all the nodes in white are unlabeled nodes for which we don't know the value. So the label nodes have a vector of 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1, according to whether a particular information is present or not. And all the unlabeled nodes are labeled currently with zeros. <clears throat> so in the first part of this approach, the first part is totally a supervised, uh, a supervised training approach, where you find out how, what are the weights for different features according to which a particular attribute should transform, uh, should propagate from one node to another. <clears throat> so uh, uh, the loss function is basically what were the original estimate of this node uh, shown here in gray and how well are you approximating it according to its neighbors. So by AIW cap, that is the empirical estimate of this node and AIW is the actual estimate of a particular given attribute for this node. And so this is the loss function that we want to minimize. And when we minimize this loss function, we estimate how important theta is for a given feature to propagate, for, for propagating a given attribute from one node to another. So this is the totally supervised training model where you only and only use label nodes. The label nodes are talking to each other and finding out how important one feature is for identifying an attribute. And the, unlo un and the unlabeled nodes are just sitting quietly and they are not doing anything. <clears throat> Now in the second step, uh, which is the actual important step, is finding out what should be the attributes of a given unlabeled node. And in this case, <clears throat> we have already estimated what are the uh, feature weights. And now we just, uh, now we just compute uh, the empirical estimate for a given unlabeled node according to its neighbors. So an unlabeled node here, uh, which has values like 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.9 estimated, it can look at its both unlabeled and labeled neighbors. And so it can look at all of its neighbors and it can ask them what is your value and what should be my value according to what your value is. And so we do this step again iteratively till we achieve convergence and at the end of the day we have a vector for all the unlabeled nodes uh, <coughs> we can, which we can estimate uh, by looking at its neighbors. So this is a semi-supervised step because an unlabeled node is talking to both its labeled neighbors and its unlabeled neighbors. So unlabeled neighbors are talking to each other and uh, that way they are better estimating their values. <clears throat> so if you look carefully, uh, throughout this setup, we are only considering at, one, uh, at a given attribute at a time. So the final set of attributes might not be valid. <clears throat> what I mean is, if you look at a word like ran, okay, you have a 0.7% uh, estimate, that 0.7 estimate that you are a verb, but you also know have a 0.5 and 0.9 estimate of whether you are at present tense or past tense or not. Because you were, at a given time, you were only querying the present tense of all your neighbors. At a given time, you were only querying the past tense of all your neighbors, right? So in the semi-supervised part, what loss function are you minimizing? And are you giving specific weights if something is unlabeled versus it's labeled? No, so in the semi-supervised uh, part, we are not minimizing any loss function. So what are you, what are you checking on? We are just iterating on whether these values have converged or not, AIW. So <clears throat> you are sitting uh, unlabeled here. You are looking at your label nodes, some of which are labeled and some of which are unlabeled, and you ask their values, so you're and you estimate your values. Right, right. 
so basically, you, you, know, ju you just keep asking till you get confident about yourself, and then you stop when you don't change anymore. Uh, Uh, I mean, when we are, you can say that it's optimizing a loss function, uh, which is how different the AIWs are at every given time step. So you stop when they stop changing, uh, but you are not training anything basically. Have you seen Parsa's model set of adsorption? I sent this paper to him, and I found out if he thinks this is novel. Yeah, <laughs> we can talk about that. Yeah. <coughs> So because I had never done uh, graph-based label propagation, I was never sure of whether this thing had been done or not. And he told me that it's uh, uh, kind of new. Um, <clears throat> so uh, for, for the word ran, you might, uh, might say that you know it's a present tense, but it's also a past tense. But we don't want that to happen. But uh, because a given word can only be in a given tense, maybe at a given time. So we want to uh, go from this estimate to an estimate which is, uh, which is uh, possible, which is a valid set of attributes. So what we do is we basically collect all attribute vectors over the labeled lexicon. So we find out what all attributes can actually exist together or not. And then when we get an empirical attribute uh, for a given word, we just project it to its nearest neighbor according to Euclidean distance again. So <clears throat> in this case, uh, since past is more confident, you will say that this word is actually past, and you will discard the present tense value. I think the semantics of your specimen can be present or can be past rather than it is. Am I misunderstanding here? Sorry? You, you have some, some words that could be both a noun and a word. Right. So, is this contradictory then? So uh, it's true that uh, for a part of speech tag, a word can have different part of speech tags. It might be true that a given word can have different tenses as well. So that information will only come from the label data. Uh, so if we have seen in the label data that present tense and past tense can appear together, we will be fine with it. <clears throat> because that information is totally coming from what is available, and we don't know whether that's true or not. <clears throat> uh, whether you know, so if a given attribute can, if two given attributes have been seen together by labeled by humans, we are fine with it. Otherwise, we'll say, okay, you can't appear together because we haven't seen you in a limited set of labels. So that's not a complete lexicon, but uh, uh, that's what we have at our dispense to use. That's a good point, because it might be the case that I have never seen a POS verb and a POS noun appear together in the label set. But if I haven't seen it, I'm right now not using any other external world knowledge to find out if I can do that. But the original lexicon, the labels, could say one and one. Exactly, because it's a, it's a context insensitive lexicon. It doesn't care about the context. It's, if a given word has appeared in any given form in the whole language, it, will have, it should have all the attributes, because it's a lexicon, again. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, OK, so since these kind of lexicons are actually not easily available for a lot of languages, we use the universal dependency tree bank, which has a lot of languages. And we use 11 of those languages which are chosen so that they have different morphological complexity and different language families, et cetera. <clears throat> and so the universal dependency tree bank has a training, development, and test set. So we use the training set as, a, as the seed set, and we use the development and test lexicons as the uh, as a dev and test sets as the dev and test lexicons. And again, because we want to construct uh, a lexicon, but the dependency tree bank has context sensitive annotation. For every given word, we take union of all the occurrences of the attributes that appear in the, <coughs> in the tree bank as its lexicon entry. Uh, although uh, there were in the paper, there were some manual exper lexicon experiments as well. This is what I'm showing because it is easily expandable across languages. <clears throat> so when we did model selection, that is when we did feature training to find out which features are the most important in predicting attributes, we saw that the cluster feature is the most important, which is, again, not a surprise, that uh, because it's in distributional information. And that's usually very, very useful in finding out which words should have similar attributes. But the second uh, most uh, useful feature was the morphological transformation feature, which basically told you how a word can differs from another word according to its morphology. So for example, again, coming to the equation of uh, going from played to playing, if you know that suffix ed is being replaced by ing, you would know that you have to go from uh, past tense to present tense. 
<coughs> so the morphological transformation feature is also very useful and the projection thing is not really a feature but something that we decided whether we want to use or not for every given language which was the attribute projection step. <coughs> so on average uh, for all the attributes across all the languages we get uh, an accuracy of 70 and an F1 score of 74.3 uh, which is uh, not very good but uh, it kind of works in the extrinsic evaluation tasks. So using this propagation framework, we have expanded the lexicon of on average across 11 languages for say for like 6,000 word lexicon to a 300,000 word lexicon. And if you keep adding more and more unlabeled words, it should expand even more and more. <coughs> so uh, in a totally unsupervised manner, where you had totally unsupervised uh, Lee extracted features, you can expand a small lexicon to a large lexicon. <coughs> almost 50 times its original size. And so just to give an example of what is actually happening at the back is uh, the words shown here in gray are the words that were present in the seed lexicon and the words shown in white is one word is a syntactically related word and one word is a semantically related word and I'm just showing what are the lexicons extracted for those words. So for example, the lexicon knew that the word study can be a noun and a verb but our system has only uh, uh, selected verb for studied and verb for taught and not propagated the word study, uh, not propagated the <coughs> noun, the noun part of speech tag as well. So our, like, so our framework like can selectively propagate a bunch of attributes and selectively stop a bunch of attributes from propagating. And if somebody knows Italian. Uh, so you evaluated this on by kind of splitting the hand lexicon in half. Right. And so therefore you're evaluating on fairly common words presumably. <sighs> I wouldn't be able to comment on that because I don't know how common are the words in different languages in the universal dependency tree bank. Uh, I, I don't know actually, but I don't think they are very common because they're like very, for example, for Czech, it's a very, very large tree bank and it has, it, it has a lot of words. <coughs> uh, the vocabulary is pretty big, but we selected a subset for our experiments. <coughs> Okay, so this is how the lexicons induced look like, yeah. What other modes do you have? Can you just They're like, I, I guess like. Is imperative one of the options? Yeah, definitely. Study, should that also be imperative? This is not complete. Okay. There are like 90 attributes. <coughs> so, okay, so the most important part for Google was basically whether these things are useful or not because they don't really care about publishing papers as much as they care about improving their search. So. Uh, they wanted to see if this can be useful in dependency parsing uh, and so we used an existing transition based parsing framework which gets very good results uh, uh, of Zhang and Nivra and uh, this is how the transition based parsing looks like. At every given time step you have a word on the stack and you have some words on the buffer and you make an arrow between them and you want to find out what should be the label of this given arrow and uh, <coughs> So we use all the features that they used to use and in addition to those features, we basically use the features in our lexicon. <coughs> so for the word he, we would know it that it's a third person, it's a pronoun, it's singular and the word shoots also, we know that it's a third person, it's a verb, it's a singular and whatnot. So we just use those as features and we also take a cross product of these attributes and uh, this helps us identify what should be the label between these two words because if you know that you know both of these things are uh, uh, third person, uh, then you you can you have a good estimate of uh, that shoot should be a, uh, <coughs> shoot, uh, he should be a subject for the verb shoots, uh, looking at these morphosyntactic attributes. <coughs> so in addition to the use, usual thing, we used uh, uh, the morphosyntactic attributes as additional features. And uh, so for Bulgarian, we saw that we have three evaluation settings here. In the first setting, we are using no lexicons. In the second setting, we are only using the seed lexicon attributes. And in the third setting, we are using the whole big lexicon attributes coming from all the lexicon. So we see that when we use the propagated lexicon, we obtain uh, an improvement of one absolute LAS point over, uh, over, the, uh, over the no lexicon at all and a 0.5 improvement over the seed lexicon. So these improvements are good improvements. and. Uh, we see that these improvements also persist across different languages like Finnish, Hungarian, Danish, etc. And uh, some in some of the language in some of the languages we do uh, we see a minor improvement or hardly any improvement at all, depending on how big the <coughs> uh, training sets were. 
so on average across, depend, uh, across 11 languages for dependency parsing, we see a 0.5 improvement of LAS score over the seed lexicon. And this is considered uh, a pretty good improvement for dependency parsing. <coughs> And we had one more uh, extrinsic evaluation task about which I'll not talk in detail, but the task is basically given a sentence, you have to find out all the morphosyntactic attributes for that word, which are context sensitive. Uh, so we use our context insensitive, insensitive features from the lexicon to predict what should be the context sensitive features. And in this case, it's basically the same thing. If we had the lexicon, we'd basically be able to find out uh, all the context sensitive features for this given word. And uh, on average across 11 languages, we again see an uh, improvement of 0.3% uh, uh, <coughs> accuracy over the seed lexicon. All right, so in this part of the talk, we saw how we can expand small seed lexicon to get, get great seed lexicons by looking at the morphological structure of the word. And I'm kind of proud of this particular part a lot because this is actually in production at Google. So they are, whenever you run a search query, their system is using the lexicons that we produce during our internship <coughs> to get better, uh, better parses or better taggers. Um, so this is uh, basically the end of the talk. But I just uh, for a minute or two minutes, I'll just talk about what other work I did during my thesis. So a big part of my thesis was also to find out how cross-lingual cross -lingual information is useful in obtaining better word representations. Uh, so for example, we saw how <coughs> word alignments across languages can be used to improve uh, word clusters, uh, word vectors. And uh, one more internship project was how we can use these alignments to extract relations across languages. Then I also worked on how uh, we can make uh, word representations more interpretable because the word vectors produced by latent semantic analysis or neural networks, we do not know what the dimensions basically mean. So for that, <clears throat> one of the projects was uh, adding more and more sparsity in these vectors to get them uh, uh, so that at some point they start making sense as in like some dimensions uh, correspond to some particular meanings. And the second part of the work was basically constructing word vectors without any distributional information. So just for a given word, collect all the information that you can from different sources in English and just have like a very, very large lexicon, a large vector with ones and zeros. So those are called non-distributional word vectors. <coughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, so it's a sparse dictionary learning thing where you take the dense word vectors produced by your system okay, yeah, yeah. and then you do sparse coding on that too. And you're assuming it's uh, and you want it to be over complete. Sorry? So you're saying sparse over complete vectors. So yeah. So you're increasing the dimension beyond the dimension of Right. System. Right. <clears throat> um, and in the in the very uh, going to the very edge of uh, exploring morphology, you can also kind of say that your uh, word vector is actually composed of characters in the vectors. And <clears throat> for that, the recent NACL, NACL paper was basically about how you can use the character vectors of a word to obtain a vector representation that can be used in generating different forms of inflections of the given word. So we use a sequence to sequence uh, LSTM encoder decoder architecture. <clears throat> So at the end, I just want to say that there are a lot of different types of techniques that we can do, uh, that we can use while solving natural language processing. You can use linguistics information, machine learning, deep learning, et cetera. But we should just remember that these are just techniques. And our work is to, our aim should be to get the work done. And whatever works for a given task should be what we should do. So uh, going ahead, I think there are a lot of really important and useful NLP tasks which I have not really at all touched during my PhD. And I'd like and be very more than happy to work on any of these things. <clears throat> and in the end, I'd like to thank my uh, co-authors and my friends at CMU, my advisor, Chris Dyer, and uh, other collaborators at CMU and uh, during my internships, and uh, you as well. Thanks. <clears throat>